Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 200 of Taking Stock. Can you believe it's been four years since we started this show and we've done 200 episodes? That's like 50 episodes a year. And what better way to bring in episode 200 than with our latest award? We've just been awarded, if you didn't hear, with the Press Association of Jamaica's Morris Cargill Award for Opinion Journalism. Uh, so that was for me, Sashel Williams, and Israel Ramsey. That's two of our team members. I'm very, very proud about that. And of course, happy to be back here with you and to see all our regulars in the comments. Let me shout out who's here already. Antoinette, as usual, is one of our first from Arizona, ready and waiting. Lithium says, we outside, Nanosense is watching from far, far away as usual. We got Ingrid checking in from Bull Bay, St. Andrew. Kish saying hello as usual. Javon saying good night, paper chasers. And who else we have? Jermaine all the way in China. Michael in Portmore. Finessing in Mobe. And a lot of other people tuning in this evening. So thank you so much for joining us once again. Thank you for joining us as usual. Tonight, it's an all analyst show. So you get an opportunity to ask the analysts any question that you've been having on your mind, because many times you guys have comments in the chat and we don't really get an opportunity to get to it. But tonight you have extra time with your analysts to ask them, you know, what do you think about certain moves that are going on? NCB dividends, Tyrone's back at iCreate. Um, somebody called Tyrone. Call him. <laughs> Guess who's back? Back again, yeah, uh, so many songs come to mind with that move. And of course, we have bus fares going down. We have, what else? Oh, duties, so less duties, because you can import more. So a lot of new developments in the past week. And if you want to know how this affects the market, stay tuned, because we've got another great show lined up for you. But first, if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter just yet, make sure you head on over to kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter so you can get all of the latest developments straight to your inbox. Up next, we have what's hot in business, and then we'll come back with the first half of our analyst session. But first, here's what's hot, brought to you by JMMB Group, your best interest at heart. He's back. iCreate founder Tyron Wilson has announced his return to the company as CEO and director. Wilson, who had resigned from both positions in August, announced his return following a vote by shareholders at the company's annual general meeting. Arlene Martin, who has acted as CEO since Wilson's departure, was not re-elected as a director. Ivan Carter, Dana Joy Wint, and Ricardo Allen were also not re-elected as iCreate directors. According to Wilson's statement, the company is putting measures in place to update shareholders about several unresolved issues surrounding his initial departure. Wilson's position as CEO is still pending board approval. The government has promised to double the duty-free threshold for imported goods and personal items at airports. Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark made the announcement at the Jamaica Labour Party's annual conference on Sunday. According to the minister, the proposal is to move the duty-free threshold for imported goods at ports from $50 US to $100 US and personal items from $500 US to $1,000. Meanwhile, Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark says the government will be increasing its subsidy to the Jamaica Urban Transit Company to help ease the pressure on customers. Starting January 1, adult passengers will see their fares decrease 30% from $100 to $70. Students will now pay $25 to travel and pensioners will pay $30. According to Dr. Clark, the government will be giving an additional $1 billion to JUTC to support the fair reductions. The Bank of Jamaica has championed the move, saying it will cushion the rise in inflation expected from the early announced fair increase for taxi and bus operators. Online Black Friday sales in the U.S. generated almost $10 billion, according to Adobe Analytics. According to the analytics firm, online sales were up 7.5% from last year, while in-person traffic at brick-and-mortar stores was up 4%. 
According to the analytics firm, online sales were up 7.5% from last year, while in-person traffic at brick-and-mortar stores was up 4.6%. Experts said consumers took advantage of big deal days during a period of still high inflation, and many consumers found it easy to compare discounts online. Adobe noted that the largest driver of online Black Friday sales came from mobile, with smartphone shopping accounting for over $5 billion of all online Black Friday sales. What's Hot was brought to you by JMMB Group, your best interest at heart. My name is Trisha Gay O'Connor and I'm an attorney at all. I attended the Real Estate Investing for Beginners course. It is a topic that has always appealed to me. I came away with a strategy as to how to invest in real estate. So I thought it was something that was a definite goal, but a far reaching one, but it seemed much more attainable once I attended it and heard the strategy. And you're better off, honestly, just buying the property, holding it, and as the value goes up over time, you can access a second mortgage or a home equity loan, as they call it. You can rinse and repeat that strategy and end up with 10 houses because all you do, you buy one. Even if it's your, your first house, you're living in there, you buy one house, price goes up over time. Take out a mortgage against you now the increase in value. Use that to buy a second house. I can, I'll tell you guys, you're in here, I'm going to pay up on the money exactly how I did it. As simple as it seems, no, I actually never thought about it. And so for me, I have a plan. I didn't expect to come out with a plan, but I came out with a plan. So I'm extremely happy. Thank you very much, Kalila. And thank you so much, Keisha. The information was presented in a very clear, understandable way. And I am grateful. This is the start of me investing in real estate. <laughs> so guys, definitely join the money, with money mission. You will regret it. Take my word. Real Estate for Beginners is available on demand or with a premium membership to the Money Mission community. Join now at moneymission.mn.co. The link is in the description. How you doing? I'm successful. How are you? I'm good. What's funny? You said you're successful. What? That mean you got business? Yes, I mind my business. <laughs> you probably too much to handle. <laughs> you got a minute? You got money? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I got money. What you want? You got cash out? No, nah, not, not cash out. PayPal? What you need right now? Demo? I don't really got no digital pay. Zale? No. Nah, Have a nice day. Hey, bro. I This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Welcome back. Welcome back. So in the Money Mission community this month, we have money marketing that is still going on. And we actually did part two, less than two of money marketing last night. And that is grow. How to get followers, get people to watch your stuff and build community on social media. And this lays the foundation for part three, which we're going to be doing next week, which is all about making money on social media. So definitely check that out. You can find the link in the description. We had a sale all Black Friday weekend. The sale is now over, but you can still access, you know, this awesome content on at moneymission.mn.co. But right about now, it is time to introduce our analyst panel because we got a lot to discuss. Uh, who do we have? Okay, this week we're joined by business writer at the Jamaica Observer newspaper, our good friend David Rose. And we have Peter Thompson, who's Group Chief Client Investment Officer at JMMB Group. Welcome, David, and welcome, Peter. Night, Kalila. Welcome back. Night. Thank you. Hey, night, night, Kalila. All right, good to see you guys. So we have quite a few topics to talk about, and I see that we have the um the import duties first but i feel like the hot topic this week is really i create so i want to start with that david you were at the investor briefing and you described it to, did you say it was a hot mess what happened agm kalila AGM, <laughs> yes the agm not investor briefing mm -hmm. so give us the first hand account of what happened no so like i wasn't expecting to go to the meeting like I was in some work and I said, should I go? Should I not go? I decided to go. I joined in, you know, Arnie was presenting about, you know, the way forward for I create, you know, the overall group, you know, give context on the Institute and how it is still, you know, recovering from the pandemic impact, gave an update on, you know, 
Visual Vibe and expanding the screen boards, you know, give an update and get paid. So had that, had the art to support, you know, reach to resolutions. So for those who don't know what I'm talking about, if you buy stock or shares in a, or, or shares in a company, each year there's something called an annual general meeting that is held. And from this AGM, you know, you vote on matters concerning the company. So the first matter would have been in this case approving the company's audited financial statements in the case of 2022. That resolution went through, you know, nobody took any relative, you know, concern with that. Then resolution two for iCreate, you know, had eight items. And like other companies, you know, with iCreate, every director has to retire and be reelected every year. The only other company on our market that has a similar structure is Squash Group Jamaica. Otherwise, you typically see one third of directors, you know, retire and being re-elected by rotation every AGM. So, you know, somebody proposed, somebody seconded, and the company secretary, you know, highlighted the strategic investment, you know, they went here with the resolution, and then he stumbled for a second, and then he's like, uh, you know, Kintai Holdings was in favor, and he's like, oh, sorry, Kintai Holdings votes against the resolution, and E-Media Group also votes against the resolution. At that point, he was just, you know, a little bit surprised trying to process, you know, the legal and, you know, the whole situation regarding, you know, this the client resolution, you know, going to come with articles and so on. So he said, all right, I'm going to continue our resolutions in the meantime and then come back to the director resolutions. Resolution three, concerning director remuneration, that was, you know, approved. Resolution four, regarding the appointment, or I should say the reappointment of the company's auditors, Sajikor and everybody else in favor, Kintai and E-Media against. Then we had the resolution five. Which and Kintai and E-Media is Tyrone, right? Connected to Tyrone, yes. So he was actually the, the proxy holder or representative for E-Media and Kintai at the AGM. And both of those companies combined have a voting interest of 52% in iCreate. So what typically happens is that when you go to AGM, show of hands, if you have more hands for or against, the resolution is carried that direction. Tyrone, you know, came and requested a poll, which meant that each share you own becomes a vote. So if you have the most shares, your vote effectively becomes the end result of the resolution. So special resolution came up, Kintai and immediately voted against it. We took her quickly to recess. You know, people were just discussing and talking. Like, it's, I, saw, I saw Ivan and, you know, Arlene you know, one side talking. I saw somebody else talking to Tyrone. Like, we're all just like, what just happened? <laughs> because typically, you go to an AGM, the resolutions, especially the ordinary resolutions, just typically get processed without any, you know, blockage or, you know, difficulty. We come back, Dimitri, you know, says we have to go through the resolutions regarding the regular directors. Uh, you know, Adrian Smith and Lauren Peart, you know, they got the blessing of Kinta and E-Media. Uh, but a regular director, you know, was shown the way out. And because the resolution was not approved, they effectively retired at that same time. After that, you know, Dimitri took about every 20 minutes just who is the company secretary, by the way. He took about 20 minutes to just go through, you know, the company's act, accuracy on articles. At that point, you know, uh, when we reach any other business, that segment of the meeting, Lauren Perry said, hey, I like to propose Taryn Wilson as a director of iCreate, to be appointed to, as a director of iCreate. And then Taryn, in his capacity as proxy holder for both Emid and Kinta, you know, seconded the resolution. And like that, boom, I created border from six to three with Tyrone back at the helm of the business now. So like that's just how it happened in such a swift and unexpected fashion. Huh. And the last wow. time you would have seen investors, well, that's you'd have seen a major poll that you know did not go in what investors anticipated was Carib Cement's uh, 2021 AGM, whereby they use their majority interest to force the royalty in to the company's, you know, 
fee, fee structure going forward. So while they'd have seen that, really, that the notice were really saying, hey, my the shareholders voted in favor, it was really, you know, just Kinta and Emedia saying, hey, we want this particular direction. Not necessarily that other shareholders in the room were like, hey, I vote in favor that that's not what happened. It's just really based on the fact that a poll was done and my the shareholder was present and directed their will, that is how we end up with Tyrone coming back on the board and we've seen these directors being pushed out of the business. So even though Tyrone had resigned as CEO, he still essentially had control of the company via eMedia and Kintyre. Correct. And so and now, that, go ahead. I was going to say, the last time, you know, would have seen a director being voted, last two times that I've seen a director being voted down in terms of the re-election re re uh, back to the board would have been back in December 2021 when Peter Shane was voted off Elite Diagnostics Board I mean the whole Alliance Financial Services saga and prior to that I believe it was Supreme Ventures at a 2020 or 2021 where a larger interest actually voted against the re-election of a particular director so it's not that these things are not necessarily unexpected but in the SVL case, that wasn't on a poll. In the case of elite diagnostic, that wasn't by a show of hands. So in that case, shareholders present, you know, spoke their interest through their vote, not necessarily by a poll where person with the largest interest directed the end result. So what was the reaction of those directors who were voted out? Because Arlene just did an interview on this show last week about the direction of, of iCreate. And then you have Ricardo, who's been a champion for Tyrone, at least in public, over the past several months. Well, something to remember is that Ricardo, well, so Ricardo and Dania Joy Wint, the total directors actually were voted out. They were not present at the AGM. Most of the oh. AGM had persons from Get Paid or I Create or from Visual Vibe. There are a few shareholders, you know, present to that extent. But otherwise speaking, Ricardo and Dania Drewint were not present at the meeting. It was Dimitri Adams, the company secretary. You had Lauren Pierce, you had Adrian Smith, you had Ivan Carter and Arlene Martin. You know, I, when I saw the on their faces, like, they were just shocked as well, like, Nobody expected this, you know, turnaround or result at the AGM. Everybody was expecting it to be a typical meeting, you know, start at 10 o'clock by probably 11.30. Well, finish, go home and eat our dinner. No, this meeting went as far as almost 1 o'clock, which is not the typical length for an AGM or a company of I create size. So, you know, you had persons present, you know, like, uh, uh, even staff members, they were just surprised that the developments, you know, Arlene and Ivan probably were not happy at what just happened because remember when Tyrone stepped down back in August, Ivan had to become the chairman of iCreate and Arlene had to step in, you know, as interim CEO and mm -hmm. get the company through a time when it was suspended by the JSC from trading. And on top of that, you know, having to deal with, you know, the cost related to the visual vibe acquisition that is still ongoing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this was this AGM was in person. It was in person. It was not streamed. So as some as you know, somebody present said this was the AGM of the century. You had to be there to actually experience <laughs> it. No, I'm, I'm serious, Kanye. Like, well, you know, we've gotten used to the last two or three years having these virtual or stream meetings. Still have some companies which will only have in person. And, you know, I think it was last year, you know, I create did have some level of, you know, streaming for their meetings. Uh, but this year, that wasn't the case. So, unless you were there, you would miss all of these developments as they were happening. So, at what point did Tyrone announce that he's coming back as CEO? He, did he do that at the AGM? No. So, if you actually checked, you know, sorry. So, his announcement to come back as CEO came through the press release. Okay. B because as the meeting was finished, like most of us just stepped out of the room and just went about our business. There was no reason to really stay after that point because you'd have had the shift in the board, terror was stepping in. There was no reason to stay at the AGM any longer at that point. 
Interesting stuff and interesting times ahead. But I do notice that the stock market appears to have, the market appears to have reacted positively. Nah, you have to contextualize Kalila. Unless you are present at the meeting or the meeting was being streamed live, the market would not have been fed that information on Friday. So that's one thing. And while the stock price would have marginally went up yesterday and Monday, today it halted at 59 cents and closed on at 61 cents. So while it would have closed for about around 78, 80 cents on Friday, it's traded back down today, you know, with some level of higher volume. So that feeling of information was relatively delayed because in the meeting was occurring at live, live stream where persons could be seeing the developments as they progressed to make their actions through buying or selling shares in the market. It was an after event thing where somebody told her you saw the release and they're getting more details as the days go by to see these price developments. Mm, okay, well, let's give it a few more days to see how investors continue to react to this news. Thank you so much for that summary, David, of what took place at the iCreate AGM and all the latest developments. So let's head back now to who we have, Peter. Peter from JMMB. Welcome back, Peter. I know I had you in the, in the background. Before we start commenting on the other issues, anything you want to add, like your reaction to what happened at, at iCreate? Well, well, it's, it's, I think this is, uh, apart from being um, the AGM of the century um, and entertaining, what it also is, is a lesson in how um, companies are run. The person who has the majority shares in a company runs the company. Um, the decisions that are made, um, ultimately, the shareholders, the majority shareholders um, run the company. The importance of AGM, the importance of understanding the dynamics of how a company is run and the corporate governance, the, the entire structure, how decisions are made, how directors are um, put on and taken off. I think this is an excellent lesson in that. Um, we'll, we'll have to see how it plays out um, over time and how shareholders respond. Um, whether or not they'll reward him and there, there'll be a turnaround um, of events. So we'll wait and see. For me, um, it's the, any opportunity that the market gets to understand how investments work. When you are buying stocks, you are actually investing in, in a company, the lifeblood of a company and, uh, in terms of its sales and how it operates. You need to understand that when you're investing. Um, and I think this is an excellent test and are an example of that. And I, I am watching to see how it all, um, plays out. Mm, okay. So the so, next big development so, so far some, of the week. Something. Do you want to add no, something, sir. David? Yes. I'm looking at the comments in the chat and for context. So the person said they didn't see the AGM advisory. So what happens is that my companies release their annual reports and usually continues the AGM advisory, but the thing is, it isn't reposted as a separate notice on the JSC. So the AGM notice and the resolutions were in accurate 2022 annual report. But if you weren't aware that the annual report was posted, it might have missed you. Because that's the same person is asking questions in the chat. And I, it's kind of good to give this clarity for persons to understand, you know, how these things work. Because if the company doesn't include the AGM notice in the annual report, it's usually published in the JS and the JSC website after. And if you are sure, well, usually it's in the mail or via email as well. Okay. All right. Moving on to the next big topic this week. It has to, it came out of the JLP's conference, actually. So Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark made a couple of announcements. It kind of sounds like election time, to be honest. And I hear promises coming out. I'm like, what? Election called? What is going on here? So one of the major announcements coming from that conference from the finance minister was an increase in the duty-free allowance. You know, when you buy your stuff on Shein and whichever websites that you like to buy on, Timu and all of them, you, have, you can spend up to $50 and then bring it in without paying duty. As of next year, April 1, that's going to go up to $100. Also, when you travel and you're coming back through the airport, you know, you have the red channel and the green channel. Nothing to declare versus stuff to declare. You get $500 duty-free allowance. That's going up to $1,000 duty-free allowance. And then we also have the announcement about bus fares going down for JUTC. 
So Peter, let's look at the duty-free allowances first. What impact is this likely to have? All right. Um, so, so I, I saw the the the, the statement, um, and I also, you know, I know this was in um, conversations um, more than a year or, or two now. Um, so its impact. Oh, I'm I'm looking at it. So I am not looking at motive of why it's done. Um, I'm more focused on the impact on potentially what it would mean, which companies would benefit, which companies would not. What does it mean overall um, for investments? So I'm looking at it now and with the value moving from 150 to 100, what that means is that you uh, most shoppers can now in, import things at $100. So, so I'm looking at mail pack and how it would affect their overall revenue. Um, so I'm looking to see um, when this is implemented, the overall impact it would have. Um, in the real economy, um, at $100 now, what we're looking at, brick and mortar stores. So the actual cost of an item, so the traditional retailer, for argument's sake, they would um, buy in bulk, bring into the island, put a label on it, um, advertise, um, pay staff, um, rent a, a actual space. Um, and actually try and sell. The increase in the duty-free um, limit now will allow um, retail investors, regular um, investors to import things at $100. Um, so no longer would they need to actually um, go to the, a store to buy a $100 item anymore. So I'm, I'm trying to, I'm looking to see how that would play out and I'm sure the technocrats would be looking at it at the pros and the cons associated with doing making such a move because it does reduce the overall bureaucracy in um, importing stuff because you know rather than be checking um every item or every um assessing every package for duty um it will reduce the amount of work required so that trade-off um leave it to the technocrats to to um weigh in on that um, but I'm looking at impact on the mail pack earnings um, and also to see how it would play out when, in the brick and mortar retail stores. I like that you brought up mail pack as a listed company because now I'm thinking that people are likely to spend more in their online shopping, which increases the value of items they would import through mail pack. And, you know, mail pack makes its money or they charge via weight. So if you're spending more, the stuff is likely to weigh more, which means they're going to increase their revenue. Well, at least that's how I see this playing out, at least for a meal pack. What do you think? Well, well, we will. I, I agree in that it should impact their earnings positively. Um, to your point, you want anything that encourages people to do more online shopping will bode well for all of the um all companies like Mailpack. Mailpack being the listed one, we're going to actually see the numbers. Um, so I'm waiting with bated breath to see if and when it is implemented, the overall impact that it will have on their numbers. You'll probably see that in the probably second or third quarter of next year. So David, you think local retailers are likely to ball over this news? We've already seen them start to ball in the Gleaner and other news publications so far. And it's a dual effect so what does that mean so under the prior 50 dollar regime which we currently still use if you import something on the 50 dollars you don't pay any duties you only pay freight and other associated costs to the actual you know freight forwarding company like a mail pack however when you're going to 50 dollars that is when you have to incur duties and potentially other charges and what you tend to also found was that some freight forwarders would charge additional fees and make clients be limited to customs charging those fees, which wasn't the case. On the retailer side, some businesses, let us say, doing clothes or other, you know, products that, you know, persons would probably import but not choose to import because of the time it takes to reach Jamaica, they're potentially going to say, hey, why am I going to go to this clothing store when I can actually just buy it online and not have to worry about the cost, not just, you know, towards bringing it in, but also the potential additional duties that come with it. So, for example, as it currently stands, if your order, for example, reduces $50, you're going to just stop and just do a second order for the remaining goods 
so that you're not attracting any duty. Because what some persons tend to have experienced is you send, let us say, ten thousand dollars for the product, well, depending on that ten thousand dollars in just fees to carry that item in. This will always vary depending on what you're actually importing to the country. But what that also caused was instead of me actually doing one order and just bringing everything in at once, I'm probably doing two or three orders just to stay under the actual duty free limit. And what that caused as well is that instead of me just spending one part and one particular sum on one transaction, I'm paying only one shipping cost. I'm paying multiple shipping costs, multiple other fees just to bring this product in. So on one hand, you're going to see, for example, in the mail pack on the forwarder side, you're potentially going to see more volumes coming in, keyword potentially. Because if I was doing three orders in the past and I'm only doing one now, depending on how would the Free, the freight for the charge of their fees, they might earn less in turn, depending on the nature of that customer. And I said they might. Because think about Kalila. If I was doing three different uh, boxes, for example, under $50, sorry, let's just say I did two boxes under $50 because of the duty that would come in. When I can instead just, you know, do one order, and even if the weight is similar, I'm not paying as much per se on let us say shipping within the USC or wherever it's coming from along with other state fees. So there's multiple layers to this entire dynamic. On the retailer side, for some retailers, it actually means that when they're, for example, going to the airport, because what some retailers actually do is that they actually fly to Miami or Florida, get their suitcase and pack it up and get back to customs. So instead of them probably carrying back just one one suitcase, but might carry two or three now. And you know that might actually bring some savings to some retailers which are actually a bit of an appropriate niche with their clients so there are multiple ways to look at it and also looking at the fact that this might result in increased fx usage because whereas i might just wait until somebody carries it into the country for example a friend i can say just import it myself and probably spend more US dollars than i would have had it just been at 50 dollars Mm. So there are multiple pros and cons to the whole development of increasing it or decreasing the, the, the minimis, which is the term that is used to describe this mark that has been increased. However, on the other hand, it was a ridiculous situation that anything after that has just carried some extreme fees. While the government you know, would have introduced some productive input tax reliefs for the creative sector and other businesses, it still technically created such an inhibitive space for some business to import goods just because of the cost that will be associated to bring it in and that is why even though that took like a nice increase in the de minimis i'm looking very carefully at the other associated measures that are supposed to come with this increase mm -hmm. because according to that clarity it's supposed to result in a reduction of about 1 billion 2.5 billion dollars in revenue for customs uh, well, I was just about to ask Peter about the impact on the economy and on government's revenues. Well, let's take that discussion after the break, as well as our questions from the audience as well. So before we go to the break, though, I have our poll question for tonight. So guys, take our poll question this evening. Inflation is down to 5.1%, which is within the BOJ's target range and the lowest it's been, the lowest it's been in over two years. How do you feel about this? A, it doesn't make a difference to my expenses. B, great news, it means we're on the right track. C, I'll wait for future updates on the economy. D, other, just leave a comment. Take that poll on Twitter and on the community tab of our YouTube channel. Up next, we've got your market recap and the analysts will be back to take your questions. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency, insurance made easy. Hey, moneymakers, join the KRM fam with our official merch. Get it now at KhalilaReynolds.com. Let's get this money. The JC Combined Index was mostly flat last week. 123 stocks traded across the main and junior markets for the week ending Friday, November 24, 2023. 40 made gains, 65 lost value, and 17 stayed the same. 117 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, valued at $1.3 billion. CPJ was last week's most traded stock. 
It took up 30% of market volume with 36 million shares trading. The stock lost 14 cents to open the new week at $9.11. Sagicor Select Funds Financial traded the second highest. The stock lost two cents to open this week at 37 cents. And Grace Kennedy rounded out last week's most traded with 10 million shares changing hands. The stock gained $2.26 to open Monday at $75.49. Now let's see who are the biggest gains for the week. iCreate was the market's biggest gainer. Founder CEO Tyrone Wilson announced his intention to return as the company's CEO during last week's AGM. The stock was up almost 23% open Monday at 70 cents. KLE had the second biggest gain last week. The stock was up 21% to close the week at $1.49. And JMMB 5.75% FR USD CR preference shares was up 15% to open the new week at $2.19. On the losing side now, Cygnus Real Estate Financial JMD was the week's biggest loser. The stock lost $2.54 to open Monday at $8.90. Jetcon was the week's second biggest loser, opening the new week at 73 cents. And Berger Paints lost 16% to close the week at $6.01. Over on the Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange, the Composite Index lost 11 points or 1% last week. NCB Financial was the most traded stock. The stock lost 35 cents to open this week at $2.85 TT. Grace Kennedy was the biggest gain of the week. The stock was up almost 7% to start the week at $3.90 TT. And on the losing side, LJ Williams fell 14.5% to open Monday at $2.05 TT. Over in the U.S., the Dow Jones, S&P 500 and the Nasdaq were all up 1% last week. Over at the pumps, gas prices dipped $3.06 last week, while the price of regular diesel lost $1.58 and low sulfur diesel fell $3.06. In foreign exchange, it took an average $156.12 Jamaican to purchase one US dollar last Friday. That's 31 cents less than the week before. Meanwhile, it took an average $114.17 Jamaican to purchase one Canadian dollar. One British pound cost on average $196.70 Jamaican. And you could buy one euro for $173.49 Jamaican on average. Finally, on the crypto markets, Bitcoin prices were down 1% over the past five days, trading at $37,013 US on Monday. Ethereum prices, on the other hand, fell 2%, trading at $2,023 US on Monday. This segment of Taking Stock, the Analysts, is brought to you by JMMB Group, your best interest at heart. Disclaimer This is not intended as financial advice. Please consult a licensed financial advisor before making investment decisions. All right. Welcome back. And we are talking. Where David gone? <laughs> David disappeared on us. All right. Let's take some comments. There he is from the audience before we uh, get back to our analyst panel. Shanna K says, I create what I want. <laughs> Orville says, I create shareholders. And I say, what I want. Nana Sen says, I've been watching Taking Stock from Nationwide Days. Big up yourself, Nana Sen, from 2019. Love to see it. Earl says, it does seem that Tyrone can manage. Uh, can or can't? Not sure if that's a typo. How can shareholders correct that wrong? Christopher wants to know what are some good bonds to buy. So maybe we come back to that one, Christopher. Javon wants, says, I create has too much controversy surrounding it right now for one to consider it being an investment option. Roswell says, why some of you saying such bad things about I create a company, all businesses struggle at times and need innovation as time goes by. So these pessimistic opinions, no help. All right. Thanks for that input. We have some more comments that we'll get to as well. But first, Coming back to Peter, Peter, we were talking about the impact of the doubling in our duty-free allowances, and I'm wondering what the impact is going to be on government revenues. How is this going to affect a government spending plan, the money that it plans to collect, and how might they, I don't know if they gave any indication, um, fill that hole? So, all right. So whenever these announcements are made, um, one of the assumptions that I always like to make is that you have technocrats looking at the numbers to see whether or not what can it be can the government afford it um so what david pointed out um 
does have some merit in the sense that the final impact will be based on consumer reaction. Um, so we know they're going to give up some amount of revenue. Um, and we're, um, could be a, a billion dollars. So we know they're going to give up some amount of revenue in this um, transaction. However, they, how do they fill that gap is important. Um, so, and a billion dollars, believe it or not, is not a big deal in, 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 in a budget that is in trillions. So the, 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 the overall gain that they may get in terms of efficiencies may um, outweigh the amount of money that they're giving up on the revenue side. So as I, as I said, the, the announcement is new. Um, there's a lot of moving parts that we have to look into. Um, which country, which companies will benefit, how it impacts the overall economy is to be seen. At the end of the day, however, I do believe that consumer, the regular consumer will benefit um, from the, the move. Um, there will be some efficiency gain, i.e. You know, you're not trying to assess um, these you know, $50 packages. So um, I, I don't see it as a major um, impact on the budget um, of the government at this time. Okay, so to David's earlier point, let me see if I can find back the the comment. You think, Mayor Pat? No, right. this is not the comment I wanted to, but this is a good one as well. Sean says, "Do you think MailPack can grow in such a competitive marketplace? I see so many shipping companies popping up, even in people's backyards." No, the reality is, this is a low barrier to entry business. There is literally nothing stopping you from opening up a freight forwarding business from florida at all we don't have what you describe as a regulated space for freight forwarders but from them interacting with customs and making sure that they carry out their respective you know duties with customs there's no regulation and that's where you've seen mail pack you know focus on diversifying into different business segments so you know packet barrel soup and other businesses segments within jamaica to just give themselves a bit of push. So, for example, remember back in 2020 when, you know, we had the St. Catherine lockdown and their man mentioned that their barrel option, you know, so they said inundated with significant volumes of orders of persons just ordering packed barrels of goods such as food and other essential items for their relatives here in Jamaica. Mail pack was pressing out here, you can actually order through a platform with pack your barrel and, you know, have it sent on to Jamaica with a is that item that you want instead? So they're look, tackling established, you know, principles that are in Jamaican culture, but it's not necessarily a business segment that anybody has really taken on in that particular angle. So that's one thing. And also, you know, diverse, so you have a personal relationship, and a highly relationship, and it just really diversifying their business, apart from between a freight forward solely to bring in goods. And one other thing I wanted to point out was earlier I was saying that when it came out to the government budget, what I was saying was that I want to see the final pieces of the puzzle because what I also pointed out was the government reduced, taking this what you'd call reduction in the budget might be made up in increased volume and transactions, which actually might result in a net off effect. So, for example, remember back in 2018, around that time when the government changed stamp duty, my person's staff flat fee reduced, you know, other transaction fees which actually spurred further demand in real estate. So the income they have lost from the reduction in the initial phase was made up later on by higher transaction volumes of people purchasing homes. So a similar situation might happen in context with this reduction in duty, and the government just might incrementally raise the duties as so a duty cost associated with bringing goods into the country as a measure to also bring in additional income from this redu this higher duty minimum or duty amount right now. So let us see what the budget looks like in February going into March when we hear the final elements or layout of this structure. But it's going to be good for consumers. As Peter King highlighted, instead of having to fight customs and say, hey, I got this on discount. This is a gift. And you know, you have all this hugging and waste of time. You probably will just go through and just move at a faster pace. And at the same time, you have efficiencies being created by customs and other agencies and you know, directing their attention to other pressing matters. 
Absolutely. Next question is for Peter. So this is on the, the duty-free allowance issue. Earl says, it's good that inflation is on the right track. Interest rates now need to move down ASAP. Do you agree with that, Peter? All right. So let us all start off by agreeing that inflation is a bad word. It's a bad thing. Um, you, you, you want price stability. So interest rates go up. Um, when the Bank of Jamaica in its fight against inflation, and I, I use Bank of Jamaica broadly, all central banks across the globe, once inflation increases, they have been on a path to actually reduce inflation by using high interest rate as one of their tools. So we have seen the, the, the interest um, inflation come within the four to six range. Um, again, I know there are you know people sitting down right now crunching the numbers at um, technocrats at the Bank of Jamaica working to see when is that when is it time to actually reduce interest rates from my personal view um, looking at the numbers once we believe um, the central banks stands that okay we are going to do whatever we it takes to bring inflation within the four to six we have seen they have used interest rate policy as a measure to actually get it down there are some headwinds um, still, um, you know, out there. So uh, the recent floods, the impact of the recent floods on food prices and inflation over time, we need to see that. So I'm I'm saying it may be too early to call. If we see a continued trend, um, I would be on that train waving that flag. It's time to bring interest rates um, down. And and the reason why I am saying okay, cautious. Is because at the end of the day, you do not want a situation in which inflation is rampant. It it destroys productivity. Businesses can't plan. So I'm on the team that says we need stable inflation and um, between within the the BOJ's target rate of four to six. However, there is such a thing as in it being too long. So um, we're going. I'm waiting to see the the impact of the recent floods, um, the December food um, hike. Um, agricultural impact and then i'm looking at this call if we continue to see this 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 trend of lower inflation within the four to six i'll be on the train calling for lower definitely um okay fair enough we do tend to see a lag between the time that you know inflation the numbers are out and the BOJ reacts in terms of their interest rates and also a lag in what the the banking institutions do Next question is for David. This one is from Orville. Well, it's not really a question. Orville says, $100 is a joke. It's still marginalized citizens look at St. Martin. And I did notice that shortly after that announcement, the PNP came out saying it should have been $150 and people still wanting more. So what is your take on the number that they chose, that being $100? There has to be an appropriate balance, Kalila. You cannot satisfy everybody. But in the same breath, you cannot take fiscally irresponsible decisions to appease some and put others at detriment. And the reason why I say that is when the increase in the de minimis went up, as I highlighted earlier, you're going to potentially see, you know, more spending. When you have this increased spending, you're going to have more USDB demanded in turn. Now, the investors have been stable in recent times. But if there's a significant influx of real demand, you know, it can potentially result in higher and higher FX rate in the absence of, you know, the BOJ's intervention to be fixed. It. And there's also the other trade back part, you know, in the sense that if you put it, for example, at $150, you're going to put a lot of smaller businesses and smaller business owners in a much more precarious position because the only benefit or advantage that they would have over a local, oh, sorry, over well, online shopping is that their product could be ready on the spot same day, which is you have been to wait probably a couple of days for it to reach Jamaica. So there is a very delicate balance that has to be maintained because any for to saver is to 150 and persons got to import more. Hey, hooray, some persons get to, you know, bring in more goods cheaper and so on. But when you have that reduced government revenue, it has to come from somewhere else. And that's the thing about it. 
there's no free lunch in you know fiscal responsibility there is some level of trade-off or further internet impact that has to come from any decision made by the government so what do you mean by that if we're increasing the the minimum to $100 right now and we're hearing about a projected 1 billion to 1.5 billion dollar reduction in customer revenue if we're to reach to 150 and at the moment spike it's probably four five ten or eight billion dollars you're going to potentially see some other increase elsewhere to compensate for that and let us say that increased competition mechanism results in manufacturers or other regular businesses increasing their prices to compensate for the higher duties at the wharf so there are multiple moving parts in raising the duty limit that you cannot take into isolation because i mentioned you have the fx effect you have potential impact to smaller businesses you have the impact to these regular businesses that are importing goods into the country to make manufacture or to carry their business so there are multiple elements to this whole discussion and we also saw you know where there was a release that because of the recent adjustment to the private taxi or private transport operators fares that the BOJ said that the projected inflation rate would have gone back out of the band, you know, around January on the first quarter. And we have to remember that the BOJ cannot in isolation just say, hey, we're going to reduce rates aggressively and, you know, allow persons to borrow again. You can end back up in the same situation of high inflation and you have to go back over this whole chaotic cycle again. So if you actually, the release has said that, you know, the reduction in the JTC fares is meant as a way to actually reduce the impact that will come from the higher private taxi operator fares or private transport operator fares. Because we need to also remember that when the fares went up in October for the private taxi operators, that was just the first one of the increase. They were also promised another increase come April as well. So, put into context, you have two levels of increase right there coming. And it's going to cause persons to spend a lot more money than they intended to. And as the BOJ highlighted, inflation and the transport segment has a higher weight in, in the basket of goods due to track inflation. So the, the reduction in the JTC fares, which covers, you know, King St. Andrew and Paris St. Catherine, which has most of the economic activity, will help to stabilize that potential impact on the higher fares. But just as a person said they want a higher duty amount. There are other unintended consequences that have to be factored in if you do such a move. So while you might see another political organization saying, hey, it should be higher, have they crunched the numbers to account for the unintended consequences that come with such a higher rate, not just to the small businesses, but to other aspects of the economy and management? Mm -hmm. So the last question we're going to take this evening, so I promised Christopher that we'd come back to his question. So uh, Peter, this one is for you. Christopher wants to know what are some good bonds to buy now with the caveat that we do not give investment advice on this show. Peter is not your investment advisor, Christopher, but are there any bonds available right now? Do you know, are you aware of, of what's on the market now? So the, the, the short answer is, is, is yes, there are. Um, a number of good bonds um, out there. And at the end of it, you know, talk to your, your investment advisor. Here's the, the, the beauty about high interest rate. High interest rate um, affects bond prices. So if you are looking for bonds now, you can get a very good deal. Interest rates have gone up. And as such, um, bonds, new bonds or bonds that you're buying now, you will be able to get a, you know, a decent yield um, on it or a decent return on it. So there are a number of bonds out there, um, both local and international. Now, depending on, um, there are corporate bonds out there. There are listed bonds on the JSC um, also. But I would say I'd recommend that you talk to advisor. Um, again, what bond it may be good for me may not be good for you. My risk tolerance may be different from your risk tolerance. Um, and as such, um, they, 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 a good bond is dependent on what you're looking for. So at, from a sector level, I'm looking at, I'm buying bonds that would be, um, the, the probability of me getting paid back is, is very high. So I'm looking for bonds that are either sovereign um, bonds or bonds that are in industries that we know will do well. Um, so I'm, the, 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 the cash cows of this world, companies that 
generate a lot of cash and you're looking to borrow money. For example, um, we saw where Apple for arguments sake has global bonds or international bonds. Locally, we have um, companies issuing bonds um, to, in order to basically work for working capital needs. There are a number of those out there. I um, don't want to you know, call any specific name, but there are these companies. And once you talk to your advisor, um, they do have um, a number of options. And now is the time. Well, this is one of the best times to buy bonds when interest rates are this high. Okay. Well, Christopher, talk to your investment advisor. And if you don't have one, open an account at JMMB. Right, Peter? Correct. So, something you said, Kalila, uh, the Bank of Jamaica publishes bonds issued by the government of Jamaica on their website all the time as well. So you're right. seeing US dollar index bonds, you're seeing Jamaican dollar bonds. So there are options you can actually check out in the BOJ's website. And some of these bonds have not as what we describe very high minimum amounts to subscribe to these bonds and on the flip side you can always you know look at alternatives like preference shares or speak to an advisor about you know potentially a bond fund or unit trust or other vehicle that gets that exposure to the bond market as well because peter is not wrong you're seeing right now companies issuing bond around probably 10 to 13 percent which Compared to probably another about two, three years ago, you're probably getting issuances at around probably uh, 47%. What this means is, so some persons, the bond is return, providing a higher return and inflation. So the real value of the money is being maintained and it's still in a more stable and predictable cash flow versus you know, the current situation where companies don't have to pay ordinary dividends. It's an option, it's a mandatory thing. So hope that can add a little more flavor to the discussion that there are other funds that have been sold out there. You can look around to see what fits your risk profile as well. Awesome stuff. Thank you guys so much for this great discussion this evening. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, David. We appreciate your presence as usual. That's You're welcome, Kalila. All right, That's and Kalila, 200. <laughs> yes. Been, been here That's from day one. That's it for the analysts. We'll take a quick break and come back with final comments from you, our viewers. This segment of Taking Stock, the Analyst, was brought to you by JMMB Group, your best interest at heart. And she's now established herself Jamaican Oprah. You get a T-shirt! You get a T-shirt! You get a T-shirt! Everybody gets a T-shirt! My name is Nicholas Samuels. I joined the Money Mission. I'm here at the Money Mission event tonight, which was absolutely awesome. The whole idea of joining Money Mission in the first place is to come and be a part of a like-minded community of everybody that wants to get some wealth, wants to do better financially, as well as to be in the one central place that has a lot of information about finances, right? One of the things that a lot of persons I know that don't benefit from is persons that are teaching financial education as well as teaching how it is that you can make wealth and generate income from multiple sources as well. Typically, that's not something that you will find unless you go out and seek it. And what Kalila has done in creating a money mission community is absolutely awesome. My name is Anita Bailey. The reason I joined the money mission is because during a very hard time in my life last year, I just completed my master's. I had quite a number of debt from that master's program and Kalila came to my organization. We had a session where she introduced us to how to budget, how to manage our money and also how to invest. And through the tools that she gave us on that day, the tools and the templates that she provided me, I was able to set up my budget. Um, organize my life, all my income streams, what my credit card debts are like and how to manage that. And I was able to get out of debt by March the following year. So I took approximately five months and this was something I was struggling with for 
maybe about a year. And with Kalila's help through the money mission, I was able to get through that. And I would advise anyone, if you're starting a business, you're looking to invest, if you're having challenges with your money, you're not quite sure how to manage your money um, as you're starting into the working world, Kalila and the money mission is where you want to be. You want to sign up with her program because it is absolutely amazing. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. So let's take your final comments. And I do have a special offer for Money Mission for the rest of the, well, between now and Christmas. I'm going to be announcing that probably next week, right? So Jermaine says, the analysts were excellent. Thanks for another great show. Blessing from China. Thank you, Jermaine. Bridget says, great job, team. Raquel as well. Sean wanted to know what risk assessment the analysts gave mail pack. Sorry, I didn't get to that one, Sean. Javon said, I create stock has not performed well since its IPO. The company may have a good business plan, but its performance on the market is not where one would want in a stock. Hmm. Kish says, it's a step in the right direction. Read the import duties, uh, re-increase in duty-free allowance, especially for those who like to sell, send barrel home. Will that really affect barrel? Because I feel like barrel is more, more expensive than even $100. Definitely not the $50. I guess it depends on what you put in the barrel. Uh, Raquel says, tonight festive, but Christmas and dividends right around the corner. NCB dividends coming out. Roswell, referring to iCreate, says, they have a mentor that oversees their activity. iCreate has a lot of big investors who buy their stock. We have Who Am I, who says you can be a passive investor or an active investor in a company. Your investment is what boosts a company's value and subsequently allows such company to strive, protect your investment. That's true. Jason says, I don't see the rate of inflation on my supermarket bill. Everything keeps going up. So here's a trick, Jason. They say inflation is going down, right? But really, it's the rate of inflation that's going down. So the cost of living is still going up. It's just not going up as much as it was before. So now that inflation is at 5%, 5.1%, that means things are still 5% more expensive than they were last year. However, earlier this year, inflation was at, I think, 11%. So things were 11% more expensive than they were last year. But whether it's 5% or 11%, things are still more expensive than they were last year. So when they say the inflation rate is coming down, they're not saying the cost of living is coming down, you know, because that would be deflation, negative inflation. The cost of living is still going up. It's just not going up by as much as it was before. So I hope that explains it, Jason. Uh, what else do we have? Who else do we have? A few more comments are here as well. Uh, Jackie says, wonderful show. Thank you. Who am I? Says you get a t-shirt. Sean wants to know how you buy bonds on the JSC. So you don't buy bonds on the stock exchange. The stock exchange is for stocks. They do have a bond market, don't they? I think they opened a bond market probably last year. So you can just give your broker a call and ask them, you know, how you can access that. I've never tried it on the bond market uh, directly through the JSC. Uh, Shelly says, I create selling bond. Tonight is pure comedy. <laughs> I have to rewatch this. All right. Thank you so much, guys, for yet another great show. It is our 200th episode. We are pleased to have been here with you so long, and we're looking forward to another 200. See you again next week. Until then, I'm Kalila. <laughs> Subscribe to the newsletter at kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter and join the money mission at moneymission.mn.co. Lesson three, money comes up next week. How to grow and make money using social media. Let's get this money. <laughs> <laughs>